Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Roll it, Tony. You guys are not the most responsible people in the world, you know. Do you know how racist that sounds? This isn't the 50s, Grace, my God. You wouldn't know the way things are going these days. I'm just being truthful. I have no problem admitting that I'm a bit racist, a little bit. Ladies and gentlemen, you just got a taste of a brand new play made possible by our first two guests today. Renowned playwright Levy Lee Simon wrote this magnificent theatrical work called Gentrified, Metaphor of the Drums. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Levy Lee Simon. Good hey. to see you, buddy. Good to see you. Buddy, how are you, John? How doing are you? Doing fine. You're doing fine. Good, good. And the gentleman who is directing this jewel play is none other than veteran actor and director Justin Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Justin Lord. Hey, y'all. Hey, guy, how you doing? Looking good. good. Morning, Ron. Good afternoon, whatever you today. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, gentlemen, and welcome to the Actors' Choice. Before we go into the play, uh, uh, Levy Lee, would you please tell me where you was born at? <laughs> Harlem, USA. All right now, all right <laughs> now. That's the Paul Theater up there, Teresa Hotel. My goodness, 125th Street. Yeah. <laughs> I was born and raised in Harlem myself. My God. And you, Justin? I hear you are from Brooklyn, New York. Brooklyn Crown Heights by way of Brownsville. <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. Yeah. I just want to let our fans know who these two gentlemen are and where they got their backgrounds from. We'll start off with Levy Lee. Le Levy, where did you get the idea for this play? For this play? Well, you know, born, being born and raised in Harlem um, and coming up, dating, dating myself and coming up in the 70s and 80s in New York, <clears throat> which was, you know, still real black Harlem and it, it was filled with all kinds of culture, but also the, the dark side, there was, it was dangerous and there was a lot of stuff going on. And, you know, and I grew up around all of that. Mm -hmm. And then over the past, let's say 15 years or so, you know, Harlem has had a makeover. Yes. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Tell us about that makeover. <laughs> right. That's why you say that makeover. <laughs> I would I would fly in from LA to New York and of course home in Harlem and you know Sunday mornings when all you would normally would see were the church ladies with the big hats, yeah. you know, going to church. And now you're seeing, you know, European people in dungarees and t-shirts going to church. And it's like, whoa, this this is this is different. Damn. You know, something is changing here. And I felt, you know, I needed to write about it, um, pros and cons, because it's not all negative. And, um, and I heard, you know, so many different sides of the story from different people. And then I had my own take on it. And, you know, when I'm writing, I never want to present one side. I want to try and make it, you know, equitable. And so people can go away and make their own decisions about what, but I want to be honest too, you know, and that's the trick, you know. Now with these changes that you, that you talk about, what comes? What comes? That's the question. That's the question. What really comes of this change? That is, that is the question because, you know, there's, you know, the new Harlem, you know, Harlem, whatever they want to call it now, you know, it's safe. You know, you have people sitting at outdoor cafes of, all nationalities and races and and there's nothing wrong with that i find nothing wrong with that i embrace that right. what what happened to the people that were there before that were moved out and we don't know we really don't know you know and why couldn't that have been um this new home why couldn't it have been available before why did it have to only happen when, you know, another race of people moved in, you know, and all of a sudden you have police presence on 116th Street and 8th Avenue. There wasn't any there before, you know, <laughs> and black, you know, and, and the crime element was running amok and, and all that. So, 
you know, there's been a change and, mm -hmm. and, um, and some of the people that were moved out would, you know, because it's also about economics, right? Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, you know, property value has gone sky high, um, you know, and a lot of poor uh, black folk were moved and they just get shipped off and no one knows where they go right. and what happens to them, you know? I like the name of the play, Gentrified, Metaphor of the Drums. What does that mean? Well, what it, what it means is that um, uh, it, I want to go back to, take us back to our origins with the drums. We're being able to communicate, you know, through this universal um, uh, sound, right? And, and I think that that is like consistent with black people all over the world, basically. But when, when that is taken away, you know, what do we have? Um, one of the stories that's in the play is that there was a drum circle that used to play in um, Marcus Garvey Park every Sunday. And then when, and we were all, you know, accustomed to that, that was part of the culture. But then when white folks moved in, you know, someone made a phone call one day and said, they're making too much noise in the park. Yes. And the drum circle was moved. Okay. And, and, and so, metaphor okay. of the drums, yeah. So you write this play, and you need a director, and enters Justin Lord. Here he is. <laughs> How did you feel getting that director assignment, young man? <laughs> uh, well, first, when I, I got to admit, when it first came to me, I, I didn't really look at it. You know, so busy with some other things. And then um, Levy and I were reunited. I hadn't really even met the brother, you know. And I met him when he was doing some acting at a the theater. And I said, oh, wait a minute. I have this play, right? But um, I said, I will definitely read it, brother. I will definitely read it now since I've met you. And I did. I was just uh, really impressed with it, the way it flowed, um, the, um, the characters, you know. And, and the, the message that it had, for me, the drum thing is about the communication. Yes. Um, yeah, definitely about the communication because through the character of Cyrus, he says one of the first things they took away from us was the drums. Got you. Our, our form of communication. Okay. So now comes the task of having to put together a cast. Tony, can you show us that picture of the cast, please? Look at that. Nine people. Yeah. Woo. May I call him out? May I call him please, out? Please, please, please. Uh, that's, that's Allison Brett Blaze, Alaska Jackson, Rachel Majestic, Stephanie Michaels, Bart Tangrini, uh, Dewan Christopher, Lamont Young, uh, Roe Brooks, and the late Arthur W. French. Um, and I'd like to also say that my, my son and grandson did the editing on this, which was very important, working in Zoom, which was Anthony Cook and Gareth Cook. Wow. wow. We that's a wonderful have a, cast. That's a, they, they, they just work so wow. well wow. in different time zones. Mm -hmm. well. Right. So uh, did you guys do this using Zoom? How, how did you put it together? We put it together through Zoom. Uh, uh, some people were in New Orleans. Some was in, in New York. Some was in, out, out here in L.A. And I shot it totally out of sequence. You know, uh, we put it together in post uh, so that it worked that way. Uh, something I hadn't done before, but I did it one time before, but yes. not in this format. I had the um, the writer involved in everything that we did. And I thought that mm -hmm. it was just so, so very helpful. Uh, Levy was there at every rehearsal. I think he only made miss one. Is that right, brother? I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but his, his, it's a new work and his input, I felt, was very important, very vital at that time to where the, stay, where the, place, the piece is at. We just happen to have another clip. Roll it, Tony. Too, you know. You don't have to be condescending. I judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. <laughs> Is there something wrong with that? If you have that baby, you cannot go around saying, I don't see color. Because the baby you have inside of you is black. And when that baby comes out into the world, the world is going to see that your child is black. The police, the job interviewer, the white man on the street, the white woman on the street. Wow. 
strange, good, good stuff, good stuff. A lot of people, gentrification, they don't get it. They don't understand what that is. Yeah, this that is was, America. That was Dwan Christopher and Allison Blaze. Yes. Some of the comments we got back, it was not just the gentrification of the neighborhood. It's a gentrification sometime of the mind. Yes. You know, and of the spirit. Um, that was one of the, one of the uh, critiques we've gotten back. Okay. I saw a very interesting cast. I saw a black man. I saw a white woman. I saw black men and white women. Reality. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Interesting cast. But it's real, because that's what this gentleman wrote about. Real stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Did the research. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> when you guys did the reading, was it done in front of an audience? Has, has that been done yet? Uh, no, no, it has not been done in front of a, a live audience in person because of COVID and all that. So we're hoping that as soon as we get a clearance from Mr. COVID and things come back in person, um, we can have a, a live in-person production. Uh -huh. uh, that, that, is, that is what we're, that's our goal. Right, right. Mm -hmm. When do you have plans for the play to actually open? Presently, there we don't have a plan for it to. Well, we have a plan, but we don't have a date as far as it opening anywhere right mm -hmm. now. I understand that the play is in memory of Arthur W. French Jr. Please explain. You want to go for that, Justin, or uh, yeah, I've known Arthur from New York. I worked with him. I've directed him before in New York, and when I had read that character uh, of Mr. Jenkins, immediately. It, his, his image popped in my head and I gave him a call. He was very gracious. Now he's going to be working three hours ahead of us, which if I, if I call a rehearsal at nine o'clock PM, it's midnight there and vice versa. Okay. And, and, um, Arthur was just so gracious with his time and his talent. And he just made that character come alive. Amen. And, and he was 80. Yeah. Nine. Uh, years old. Well, you know, waking, working at 12 o'clock at night from New York City. And I just might add that, you know, I met Arthur when I was a young pup, when I first came at 22 years old. And someone said, oh, you got to see this guy, Arthur French. And I met him through some other actors, uh, Nathan George, who was one of my mentors. And, and um, he was just always this, this, this soft, gracious beautiful guy but you know his immense talent when he got on the stage it was like whoa who wow where did that come from you know because you never saw it like off off the off the stage or or before the camera you know so it was a pleasure it was an honor to have him work on my play you know um before he left the planet it really was an honor right but I'm kind of going to jump ahead a little bit here because do you see this play becoming a movie? <laughs> Don't have to ask that question. <laughs> you got you know, that one, man. <laughs> but I always see my my plays becoming movies, but actually this one I think has legs for a, a TV series because there's so much to unpack. I don't think one movie would do it justice. I think that it needs to have a season, you know, and maybe a few seasons, right. you know, to unpack everything that it involves, all the different kinds of relationships and neighborhoods, the people, the, the characters. History. Yeah. The history. yeah. Yeah. Wow. So we have just a few more moments, but we want to get to show you the closing of the play. Roll it, Tony. Mr. G. Obatala, Yamea, and Oshun bless you. Yamea, give me power. Take this man home. May your spirit rise 
above the clouds and the moon. May you find your freedom soon. Let your body become light as a bird and may you travel on these words. Winds of the universe, take this man to the place where his spirit began. Allow him to lift off the ground and fly back to where his spirit is bound now. Up, up, up into the sky and fly. Fly, 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 fly! Woo! Oh man, hallelujah, as they say. God bless you, Levy Lee. God bless you there, Mr. Little Justin. Thank you. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was I understand. Alaska Jackson. That was Alaska. 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 Yes, I was going to say. And and the late um. Yeah. Gotcha. Tell us about very very quick the Road Theater Company. Uh, the Road Theater Company. We have this up on their their, their website. I mean, yes. the YouTube channel. Uh, you can go to the Road uh, YouTube channel, and it'll be. You just scroll down to uh, Gentrified. It'll be a picture of um, street signs, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X street sign. Just click on it, and uh, there you go. You go into it. Uh, the Road Theater Company is a company out here in Los Angeles that I'm, I'm a member of as a director, and they're doing some interesting projects. Yeah. Levy Lee, Justin, I want to thank both of you for bringing a dynamic play for all to see. Again, best wishes on this project. Definitely. Thank you, Ron. Definitely. Thank you for having thank us. You. My pleasure. And, you know, and thank you for doing what you're doing. Really, really. It's my pleasure. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen. I, I, I second you. that. I second that emotion, indeed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Levy Lee Simon and Justin Lord. This is the Actors' Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to let you know that we are asking our actors group to help us get a former baseball player, Kurt Flood, into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, Kurt passed away in January of 1997. He was the husband of one of our wonderful guests, renowned actress, Judy Pace. All you gotta do is call us up at 213-349-3941. That's 213-349-3941. Ladies and gentlemen, we sincerely thank each and every one of you for being a part of this magnificent award for a great baseball player. Roll it, Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, my next guest today is an award-winning writer, director. Now, through the work she has accumulated over the years, this lady continues to take de definite steps toward realizing her lifelong goal of telling meaningful, meaningful stories that entertain, inspire, uplift, and explore what it means to be human in this complicated world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nundi Ba. Bo. Bo. I get it right there. Bo. Okay. Yeah. No, greetings, no, no, and welcome to the Actors' Choice. The, she, when she asked me just now, ladies and gentlemen, you didn't hear it. She was saying, "Where's the sound? Where's the sound?" She's mm -hmm. not hearing the sound. When we get a when you get a copy of this tape, you'll hear the sound. Definitely, you can tell. There's a lady who say, "Hey, something missing here. I see the I see the back picture, but I don't hear nothing. What's going on here?" <laughs> yeah. Just tell us where you're from, my dear. Where you from? I'm originally from New York, born born in New York. Moved to the Bay Area when I was uh, a teenager. Okay. So in San Francisco and Oakland. Okay. And I went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. Um, <clears throat> so I'm kind of East Coast and West Coast, but then as an adult, I moved to Los Angeles. Got you. I heard you say something, two words that catches my ear whenever I hear it. Did I hear you say Howard University? I did. Oh, good grief. Then, I know, then you know about wings and things, don't you? I do. I do <laughs> indeed. <laughs> ah, and W H U R, that's the right. Bison's. Oh, that's right. that's oh. Right. When I was in the Navy, I was stationed in Washington D.C. for about eight years, and I spent some time just getting to know the city. And I always would go to Howard University, a very wonderful place to go to. I'm, I'm not talking about this recent stuff that's going on. That's that's bunk. But at the same time, this was beautiful to know Howard University, an excellent excellent educational outlet. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, for, our, for the benefit of our audience, some of them don't understand what is, when we say a second unit director, what does that mean to them, to you? Well, all right, I'll, I'll start with the second assistant director, which is what I, I was, uh, I worked as the first assistant director and a second assistant director for the most of my career. Mm -hmm. So those are the people who are the management on set. Um, they sort of make all the logistics happen. They're the ones who have their fingers in every pot. They make sure the actors are there in time, the crew is there, equipment's there. Um, they are the logistics people on set. Um, as you become a first assistant director, it's your job to make sure that the vision of the director is, is, is manifested. So you're the person who reminds them that they should get another angle. You're the person who um, is just their, their right-hand person. That's you. Now, a, a second unit director, often on films, there are shots that the main unit can't do. And so the second unit director goes out and actually directs those shots. So I got that opportunity a few times as well. Now, according to my research, I see after graduating from Howard University, you moved with your family to Malawi I did. in Africa. I Tell did. us about that place. Well, my mom got a job in Malawi, uh, training nurses and midwives soon after I graduated. And she asked me if I'd come and I thought, no, like I, I wanted to go, but at the same time, I felt like I was supposed to, I didn't want to go back to living with my mom, um, but I knew it was an awesome opportunity. And I went there and after a few months of helping her get sorted out, she's a single mom and I had a younger brother and a younger sister. So that took a big, you know, it was a big deal. We had to learn how to drive a stick shift. We had to learn how to drive the other side of the road. Um, in that country at that time, women had to wear dresses and men I had to have short hair, it was a different country. Um, I then realized that I needed to either come back to America to work in the film business or to figure out a way to, to make a living in the film business. And so I went to a different country, Zimbabwe, where at the time they were making lots of films. And I kind of hustled my way, you gotta be a hustler. So I hustled my way. Hustled. Yes, indeed. I hustled my yes. way onto five films in Zimbabwe. I so at wow. the time, they were shooting Cry Freedom there with Denzel Washington and Kevin Klein. They shot Mandela with Alfie Woodard and Danny Glover and a number of other films. And so I was able to work on five features there in Zimbabwe at that time. I like the way you said, I hustle. Yes, you hustle. I do. Did. You know that song, Do the Hustle? Oh, yeah. I did. Well, that's, you know, we all know when you want something bad, you kind of... Um, especially then there wasn't that much agreement for African Americans right. in the film business. And so you had to sort of, you know, I said I would work for free and then I would work really hard and they'd end up paying me. Gotcha. Uh, there was one project that you did called Jake Speed. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, it was a story about, it was a story about a, a revolution in, in a, a made up African country. And uh -huh. that was another one. They, I, I, I went and I tried to get a job and they said, we know you're good at your work. Right. We can't actually hire you. We don't have the budget. We, and so I was like, okay, well, I'll volunteer. And of course, they ended up hiring me and I, I did awesome work. Um, I was a second, second assistant director, which is just below the second AD. It's amazing how the pecking order is to get the final product. Do you, do you, when you're down at a lower level, can you give some instructions to the people or advice to the people above you or vice versa? I think you have to do it you know, kind of secretly, you have to sort of say, um, do you mind that such and such is happening? Or, do you know, is it okay if blah, blah, blah? Or I thought, you know, you have to, just like with any job, you can't, if you're at the bottom of the totem pole, you can't sort of perk up with a bright idea all the time. But if people know that you're thinking and you're smart, then they start to sort of look to you and, and, and make sure you, you sign off on what they're mm -hmm. doing. Is there in the future, do you see yourself as a director, just plain director? Yeah, everything I'm doing is so that I can be a director and um, I've written a number of screenplays. I'm, um, I've produced a number of works. And so um, one of the things I wanted to do, if you're okay with it, is I've written a memoir called Hollywood to Bollywood. I don't, I don't know if you, if you knew that. Please, please go right ahead. I lived in India for three years. Uh -huh. And part of my moving to India was sort of I wanted the experience for my family and my kids, but I also got some tricky health news that inspired it. And so I wrote a, 
there's a, a memoir that I've written, but this is a, just a small chapter out of it, a small couple of paragraphs from it called Bad News Bear. Mm -hmm. As I sat in the car at the St. Joseph's Hospital in Burbank, the parking lot security guard peered into the car to see if I was okay. I wasn't. The combination of me bawling my eyes out and the drizzle outside was fogging the windows up. My son Taj would freak out if he saw me using the Star Wars uniform to blow, his, blow my nose. I was a sight. I had puffy eyes, big hair, and a Grey's Anatomy badge hanging from my neck. The guard was probably trying to figure out whether he should get me a tissue or call the police. He knocked on the window to tell me that I dropped the stuffed bear, bear they gave me. Just for the record, I threw it. I rolled down the window and he shoved the bear in. Thanks, you can keep it, I said, because I didn't want their pity bear. I knew what it meant. Let's be honest, hospital technicians don't just give bears away for no reason. I watched and worked in the television and film industry my entire life. Stuffed bears are a bad sign. When they give a grown woman a cute stuffed bear and they tell her that it'll all work out, after hours and hours of testing her brain, it's not good news. So, so that's a, that's a, from a chapter in my memoir. And based, based on that memoir, I, I, I'm developing a television series. Got you, got you. When some of this stuff, television is television, but how about the memoir? Is that book going to be on the market soon? I am looking for a publisher. So okay. that's what I'd love. I, I, I'm looking for a publisher. It's um, it's a story of a woman taking her family to India. She took uh, three children to India for three years. Okay. All righty. Let's fast forward to 1989. You and a fellow crew got together with a gentleman by the name of Spike Lee. It was yes. a favorite called Do the Right Thing. Yes, indeed. <laughs> indeed. I, um, I was recommended on the, for Do the Right Thing. I was a production assistant, which is yes. even lower than assistant directors. I was production assistant on a film called Lean on Me. And my boss, um, I, I got a, a call to interview to work as a second AD on Spike's film, Do the Right Thing. And so I, I, I interviewed and they offered me the job and I had to break it to my boss. And I said, you know, I got this job offer on Spike Lee film. He's like, I know, I, I recommended you. I was like, oh, okay, well, can I leave to go do that? He's like, no. <laughs> He said, I recommended you with my heart, but I don't want you to leave. But anyway, obviously, he let me leave. And I went to work on Do the Right Thing. And we shot 30 to 40 days, I'm not sure how many days now, um, on one block um, in bed -Stuy, And it was just a life-changing event. Um, so many of the actors were, um, were just at, at, at the beginning of their careers. And then excuse me, then you had people like Ruby D and, and Ozzie Davis and Danny Aiello who were sort of at the prime of their careers. And Spike, um, you know, usually on film sets, you put people in, in, make a, in big trailers. And instead of that, we cordoned off an area of a gymnasium and each actor had um, just little curtains separating them. So Spike Lee was in a, a little a little area next to all the other actors. And so it was very sweet. It was very lovely that it was kind of a, a lot of camaraderie. Um, I like those behind the scenes that you were talking about. That's beautiful to see. People don't see, we don't hear about this. We don't see this thing. We see the finished product, but we don't understand how it got there. Yeah, and, and yeah. usually on film sets, it's a, it's a big hierarchy thing. Like if you're the big star, you get a huge trailer. And if you're yes. a little star, you get a little cubby hole. <laughs> and on this film, everybody had the same little cot and curtain with their name that I wrote really nicely with <laughs> before computers. So I wrote their names really nicely and pinned it to the curtain. Gotcha. So it's really sweet. All I can say is thank you, Scott Spike. Thank you very, very much. We got time for one quick. We, we got a film that I took out of your a roll. Real? Can you roll that on me? I'll get this from you when you're ready. I uh, got this, sweetheart. You never told me what it is that you do. I'm in business. Finance? 
No, no, I do. Uh, I'm into uh, shipping, uh, receiving, uh, importing. I knew when I saw that, I said to myself, hey, I know that guy. That's Dick Anthony Williams. Yes, it was. It was. He's now gone, ladies and gentlemen. What a guy. What, wasn't that such a special scene? Yes. Yes. Uh, I understand it along the way, because you've got a lot of stuff in your resume. Right. AFI grad. Not bad. Uh, and then there was a DGA Disney directing fellow. Not yeah. bad. We had uh, Iona Mars Jackson on here a couple of weeks ago. She was a graduate of this year, from last year. So all these things, it, it helps the training, gets you there. Uh, and the question is, what is the ultimate goal that you want to achieve, my dear? I want to obviously keep writing. I want to direct, but I also want to produce projects as well. I want to sort of, it's time for me to, to uh, create projects and to be able to, to give others opportunities as well on those same projects. So that's what I'm hoping for with, with Hollywood to Bollywood. Um, I'm hoping for that with a contemporary drama that I'm creating as well, that I can sort of write it um, and then sit in the chair and say, yes, no, maybe so, um, as other people are, are helping to bring that, that to fruition. Bless you, Nadi. Bless you. One more question. Yeah. How do you want to be remembered? I want to be remembered as somebody who, you know, one of my, one of my little private issues is that Black, um, the world feels like Black people look one way. And I love how diverse we are, how we're not the same. And so I would love to be someone who is remembered as creating, uh, creating characters that show the breadth of, of, of African Americans and that help us show our humanity and help us realize our humanity. Very, very much, Nandi. I want to thank you for being a guest today. Best wishes in the future. Thank you. I'm very, very proud to have met you. Now, we'll get you back. We'd love to get you back again. Oh, I'd love okay. that. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah. Nandi Bo, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Axis Choice. I'm Ron Brewington. Roll it, Johnny. <laughs> this is unscripted. Lene Bell, a.k.a. LB, is the founder and president of Bell Hall Talent Incorporated, a full-service talent agency to the stars in television, film, comedy, commercial, print, and literary. Beauty, brains, and bravado. This triple threat boss has also written her name in the history books as the... My next guest today is the CEO and partner of Bell Hall... Let me say it right. Bell Hall... Hell. Hell. Target Incorporated. I didn't say that right. Let me do that again. CEO and partner of Bell Hall Talent Incorporated. My eyeglasses. She represents talent in television, film, comedy, commercials, voiceover, print, and literary. Known as LB, she has a reputation for being one of the most aggressive and tenacious talent representatives in Hollywood. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lani Bell. My dear, welcome to the Actor's Choice. Was, there, was, there was a window. I, I, I said that word wrong because my, my went something on my glass. <laughs> Early morning. Before we begin, can you please tell us? And you're looking good today. Tell us where you came from. When you say where I came from, you mean where I was born? Yes, ma'am. Seattle, Washington, two oh six in the house. Yes, Since, house. Seattle, Washington. Look at that. Seattle, Washington native. Yes, yes, yes. That's my hometown. Yes. I just reside here in Los Angeles. I see. Uh, I, I know Seattle because I had a chance to stay up there and watch the Blue Angels, Sea Fair. Mm -hmm. A lot of things happen in that town. Wow, the ferry, all that good stuff. I miss it. I have family there. My father's there. Um, but I have brothers and sisters there. Um, I, I loved Seattle because of the family orientation, um, not so much of the weather. So I, I made a choice. <laughs> it was uh, weather or fam. Well, well, that sounds bad, but yeah, I chose the weather. But I still love my family. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Please explain the function of a talent agent. You know, um, in, in in its easiest term, we help writers, producers, directors, actors, um, professional mm -hmm. professional actors, music. We help them find jobs. That's that's the short end of it that's that's what we do we negotiate on their behalf that's my favorite part but we help you find jobs and negotiate those jobs uh so you can have the best outcome 
and you actually have a team member in support of you. Okay. So can I be an actor without a talent director or agent? Yes. Yes, you yes, you are. You get to do you, be you, and just shine. Um, because again, actors, I mean, there's millions of actors, right? So mm -hmm. you don't have to have an agent, right? Um, but there's levels to that. And when you're ready to not have to negotiate your own terms or to make sure some of these things are correct, that's when you want to start bringing in a team. And and I believe um, everything works well when you have a team, right? Yes. So that is when you're ready to go to your next level. And I always hear talent say, no, I got this on my own. And then when we negotiate contracts, we're like, well, you did a great job here, but here's some things that could have helped you. Here's some things that we could have looked out for you. So it becomes this team effort. Team effort, only way to go. Only way to go. Your CPA, your agent, your publicist, all these different people, your agent, all these people you have. Exactly. It's all, it's all there. And a lot of people get caught up on fees. They get caught up on pricing. But, you know, I like to believe, especially when you have a great negotiator, that um, we, we, we add our weight in gold for you on that aspect. We can typically try to get the plus tens, get the pluses or beef up what your average into what, what they would have offered you. So it just pays for what you were going to get anyway. Gotcha. gotcha. Um, what kind of work did you do did, did before you got into this line of work? Ooh, okay. So I um, was a real estate agent prior to, and I was, I did wireless communication. So I used to sell um, cell phones to people back in the day. I was a cell phone lady, but you know, what I look at was everything was communications related. And then prior to that, I worked at uh, UCLA hospital. I was a nurse, a uh, phlebotomy. I love medical. Uh, my, my desires was to be an attorney, which that will happen and to work in some type of of medical, but I, I, what I believe, it became the people person business. And that's kind of what landed me here. My mother was a producer or is. Um, so it put me in a, a place of where I was always around this. I just never knew I'd have a title for it. So that bug came along and bit you. And here you are today, yeah. talent agent. Excellent. But it, it, it's funny, people were telling me what I should be and I didn't even know they had a, t a name for it. Wow. Um, so I, I met my, my big sister, Sheila Leggett, um, and we helped Angel Conwell with Bentley Cal 11. They put on a, um, a screener and, um, we, we did an upfront kind of, you know, like a showing a viewing yes. and we celebrated her birthday. And in that, um, they were like, you should be an agent. And that's what she asked me. She was like, come partner with me. And that's when I got the title. So, uh, it's been a blessing ever since. Okay. Who was your first client? Ooh, first client. I believe when I started, well, okay, so um, at Media Artist Group, uh, let me see, we had Vivica Fox that was there. She, I was so excited. Uh, I, I uh, Sir Mix a lot. Kenny Lattimore, I believe, was there. Um, oh my God, Lenny Vondo. There were so many big names, and it was people that I grew up to. And I was like, Oh my God, I love these people. And I remember the first time Dorian Gregory, you know, from Charmed. I was like, Oh, you know, I couldn't be an agent and have a crush, but I was like, Oh my God, Dorian Gregory. So it was pretty cool. That's a crazy question. You see uh, the people who do the work that you do depicted on TV and in, and in films and stuff like that. Is it really like that? I mean, we, we let, let's just say Hollywood is a little overrated, um, but we do, we, you know, we, if you're talking about entourage or if you're, it just depends on what aspect the positive or the negative piece that you're pulling from, it might be a little kind of character, some kind of characteristics, just a little bit, just a little bit in there, but not all, not all. I, I like to believe with our agency, we're more of a family oriented agency. You know, the, my, uh, our team, uh, the team, they're my partners. Uh, we partner, so the client doesn't just get one agent, they get everybody. It's all women, you get all of us. You love us all or you don't love us at all, right? So it, it, we, we give a different type of environment. I see some of your current clients include Hal Williams. Yes, 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 I love Hal. 227, been around a long time. Mm -hmm. Art Evans. Uh, yeah, Art Evans, yes. There, oh, there he is. His, yeah, his wife is beautiful. I love her. I love yes, her. I love babe. I love babe. Oh, is babe, yes. babe is something else. Uh, Sir Mix-a-Lot? Sir Mix-a-Lot, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, back, I was in his first video, actually. Uh -huh. I've known him since I was 16 years old. So uh -huh. fast forward to us still having a relationship far as in business is pretty cool. Garrett Davis? Garrett Davis, yes. Love Garrett. 
How many people do you have uh, in your in, in your company? Oh my God, we got Emmanuel Lewis, Asmari Livingston, Heather Langenkamp, uh, Travis Wolf Jr. was one of my youngest series regular in Bob Hart's Abishola. Uh, Nikita Ka uh, Calame from um, uh, Nikita is from the, she did the first Lion King. Um, Melissa Ford from Soul Food. Oh my God, James Moses Black. Super excited about him. Comedians. Um, Kenny Lattimore is still with me. I love him. Um, and and I have some new surprises that I can't talk about right now. But yeah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> wow, wow. Whew. What's a typical day like for you? You know, two years ago, or when COVID happened, um, everything shifted, everything shut down. So uh -huh. a, typical, a typical day for me now is prayer, first thing in the morning. Wow. It started ministry, first thing in the morning. We launched Got Connections. Uh, when COVID happened, I asked the Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, you already know. And um, we birthed got connections which is a ministry from there started the search engine so a typical day for me is god first okay then from there mm -hmm. we move on to meetings um pitching mm -hmm. communication but uh I, I was taught and as i've been going through my ministry training it is god first then everything else mm -hmm. and and since i've adapted that into my life i'm mm -hmm. watching blessings upon blessings happen so for me that's that's my centerpiece Excellent. How about changes that you've seen in the business over the past 15 years? Changes? Well, I mean, obviously, the way we do business now is a little bit differently because a lot of things are electronically. Um, right. But I, I like to believe it's, it's always about relationships. And so I can't say it's been a change there. Maybe it's easier access to build the relationships, right? But um, uh, for me, I, I like the fact that our, our color, we have voices more than we did before um and women you know i i'm proud to say women are that we're doing our stuff <laughs> you know before it was more man ruled kind of industry and uh, the fact that we're being embraced and that even clients are looking for strong women to support them and push because we're getting things done so i'm happy uh, about that change LB, you, you know, uh, we said this earlier, you have a reputation of being one of the most aggressive and tenacious talent representatives in Hollywood. Please tell us how you got that reputation and how, what do you do to maintain it? Okay, so when I started as an agency, uh, the first agency media artist group, uh, uh -huh. Raphael Burko, I Ralph, um, he was like, you're a little over aggressive. And I didn't understand what that meant because I'm very outspoken. I'm very loud, right? Yes. In, in that, and if I'm passionate about something or I believe in something, I'm going to fight for you. And um, when I, I took away that being a negative thought, and when I left and had to start my own agency, it became why not? Why can't I be tenacious? Why can I not? I mean, why can I? Who says I can't fight for you? Who says I can't do these things? Why do I have to be looked down? <laughs> so I decided, no, we're going to take away the stereotypes. And that's what I am. And I'm not going to change for anyone. Go ahead. But you're bad, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right. right. Because once you take away those layers and you start, not, you, we tell talent always be you, do you shine, right? That's the one thing you don't need permission to do. So why would I lure me for something else to sense? So here at the agency, we we get to that. I love negotiating. That is my favorite thing. I, lo I love looking like I'm the youngest uh, owner in the room or the longest agent, the, the youngest agent in the room to find out I'm seasoned and that I'm a great negotiator. That's kind of where that title came from because you don't expect it from me. It's marvelous when you can talk. That's a big thing, communication, being able to talk to two people, to, to find out where you're coming from, what you want. Those are things you have to do. You have to know how to talk. Yes, I believe everybody should walk away happy. It's yes. not a one-sided thing. It becomes, everybody becomes whole. And if we can figure out how to make everybody whole, it's a win-win. Okay. Tell us about GotCon, please. GotCon means God's over this vessel, GotCon. It's shortened for Got Connections, but it is a search engine. Um, 
<laughs> I was blessed uh, with that vision in 2006 to launch a private search engine. And with mm-hmm. that private search engine, it's a, it's a, it's like a Google or if you've heard yes. of that, go. We don't track you. We don't trace you. I tell my clients often, if your phone ever got lost, <laughs> I don't have to worry about you on TMZ because that information is erased. But you're not tracked. You're on an un, it's an anonymous search, um, but it protects you because again, you don't get cy- cyber bullied. Okay. How did you, what, what brought you into that position to use this? Well, um, well one, one of the things was the vision um, that I received about being a, being a search party. Mm-hmm. And then it was connecting dots and connecting people. Then it became, well, if the world says bullying people in public is wrong, why do we bully people on the internet? And why not have a safe atmosphere a safe place where we can search things freely and not have to worry about things tracking us and searching us, tracking our IP addresses, just tra- everything that we do. And I, I, I don't believe in that. I'm not a believer of that. So uh, we kind of uh, sat with the engineers and this is kind of what we came up with, uh, spiritually driven. Got you. Ladies and gentlemen, drum roll here. I understand that LB recently got appointed as president of the Hollywood chapter, Black Chamber of Commerce. Commerce, can you tell us about it, please? Black Chamber of Commerce, Hollywood, yes. Super excited that um, December, uh, one of my girlfriends, uh, Sharifa Harder, who also is the president for the Long Beach chapter. Yes. Um, she, uh, we were talking and uh, she asked me to come to one of her chambers and it was in Long Beach. And I was like, don't you have one here near me? Um, and she was like, no, but maybe we should. So we went on a mission. I sat with Mr. Wallace, hi Rich. And, um, <laughs> we had a great conversation and just, it clicked and it was just like, why not? Uh, so we looked at how to redevelop what Hollywood was. Hollywood was the original chamber that launched all other 13 chapters. Uh, his coin phrase is from the desert to the sea as he expands. And for me to be a part of that has just been an amazing thing. And I'm super excited. Excellent. Well, I, any special projects you're going to be working on through this part pro program? Um, well, you know, for me to provide uh, access to capital was my biggest thing to provide information to business owners. The networking of business owners was the biggest part for me. Right. And what we could build, I always imagine it, this economic system where us of color could come together and we're working to and for each other together. So we all win versus it just being top heavy. So for me, it becomes how do we all get get all these opportunities? Gotcha. And that's what I like to teach, train, share. And we keep just recycling those same things. So the incomes are coming to everyone because we're all entrepreneurs at heart. Beautiful, beautiful. Tell us about a goal that you have not yet achieved, but you want to do it. Um, I plan on, um, Lord willing, um, becoming an attorney. That is the goal that has been a, uh, a vision I've had or wanted to do since I was five years old. I wanted to be a doctor and an attorney or a lawyer. So um, I pray uh, 2022 for my 50th. Uh, I'll look into uh, school, uh, look into what that's going to take for me to get started. I thought I was going to start in 2020, but the Lord redirected me and I am not. (laughs) I am no way complaining. I love it. I'm so happy. He centered me. uh, So now I can move on, but I want to be an attorney. Because I act like one anyway. (laughs) Here's a question I always ask people from time to time. How do you want to be remembered? Um, A lover of God. I, I want to be, you know, I, I, I've prayed for the last few years to have that agape type of situation that I can be a lover of God and people knew me and they knew my heart. Everything else from there resonated. So that to me, that one, once mm. you love and you can give that love to everything, especially spiritually up, then it resonates outward. So that means you get to help, you get to support, you get to do all these different things. So uh, for me, it just, it, to me, it's a full circle. Wow. wow. I'm waiting for you to write that book. I'm waiting for you to write that book. It's Ooh. there. It's there. It's there. I have actually two of them I'm working on now. Wow. Anything else you want to tell us? Um, no, I, I am super excited and I'm thankful that you took the time to want to interview me. I think you what you do and I'm honored to be a part of what you've been doing for years. So I appreciate you and I thank you.
LB, we thank you very coming from you. That means a lot. We thank you very, very much. I want to thank you for being on our program. I know you folks will learn a little bit about what's it like being in the business, having an agent. Best wishes to you in the future. Indeed. Thank Keep you. it. Keep it up. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I want to add on my dot connection family. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> and to uh, everybody else. Thank you very much. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, Lanella Bell. I want to thank our sponsors, Harvey Raman, Photography is an Art, Ron Irwin's Lose Life, The Way to Lose Weight, Larry Beaver's Book to the Future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm Agent Carla Green and veteran actor Rob Bryanstein, Actor Training School and Actors Shape. And ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank our special guest today, writer-producer Levy Lee Simon, actor-director Justin Lord, second unit director, assistant director Nani Bo and CEO, founder of Bell Hall Talent and Literary Agency, uh, Lanella Bell. And of course, special thanks to our ever-growing audience. We say be well. We'll see you next time.